Welcome to the Disney Parks Podcast with your hosts, Tony Castlenova from DisneyByTheNumbers.com and Park Hopper John from WDWParkHoppers.com. Keep your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the podcast at all times and get ready for the Disney Parks Podcast. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Disney Parks Podcast. We have got a great show. We've got a phenomenal guest. I can't wait for you to meet her. Uh, Catherine Price resides in a small rural town in northern Maryland with her family and three children. She graduated with honors from Frostburg State University with a bachelor's degree in liberal arts and later returning to obtain her master's degree in business administration. Well, since she was a little girl, Catherine has had a passion for writing. She's studied the art of creative and technical writing throughout her educational experience. Writing was a way for Catherine to express herself, and she uses it as a creative outlet. And the reason that she's here is because she is the author of Walt Disney's Melody Makers. We cannot wait to talk about her and her book. Welcome, everybody. Catherine Price. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, We're very excited to have you here tonight. Uh, first question we'd like to ask everybody is, how did your Disney journey begin? Well, I have loved Disney ever since I was little. My family grew up going to Disney World. You know, that was our favorite family destination for vacation. So Disney was instilled in me at a very young age. And, you know, as I grew up, I just kind of grew with my love of Disney and when I decided to write a book, I knew it was going to be something Disney related. So I kind of, you know, went over all of the different aspects of Disney. And the thing that really stuck with me the most since I was a child was the music. You know, when I was a kid, I would run around singing all the, the Disney songs and driving my family crazy. And so the music has always stuck with me. And the more I listened to Disney music, the more I realized, you know, Sherman Brothers were some of the greatest Disney songwriters they had and definitely one of the original you know, songwriting teams, and they had so many tremendous songs that helped shape my childhood, and when I looked into their story, it was such a great story. I just knew it had to get out there. So when was it like the first time you went to Disneyland or Disney World? Uh, I think when I went to Disney World for the first time, I was definitely too young to remember it, um, but I can remember being maybe like five years old, and it just feeling like you know, the greatest thing ever being there. It was like being transported into a different world and it was so magical. And it was, you know, someplace I definitely had to come back over and over and over. And as an adult, it's still my favorite place to visit. So um, Walt Disney's Melody Makers, uh, can you give us a quick overview of what the book is about? And then we'll kind of dig into it a little bit more. Sure. Well, Walt Disney's Melody Makers is a biography of the Sherman Brothers. Richard and Robert Sherman, uh, you know, they were Walt Disney's go-to boys. They were pretty much the soundtrack of all of our childhood. Uh, you know, everything from It's a Small World to Winnie the Pooh and all of the songs from Mary Poppins. And so so this fascination you had about these these guys leapt out at you. Have you, um, have you had a chance to interview them, I'm assuming? Or are you, are you collected stories about them? How did you go about collecting all your data for writing the book? Well, the idea for the book, I met Richard Sherman back in 2011 at the D23 Expo, and he was doing a panel on It's a Small World and talking about how he and his brother had developed the song and, you know, just various songs that they had come up with for Walt. And I was just really involved in this story that he was telling, and I thought, wow, this is so interesting. This guy is so charismatic. He's, he's so fantastic, and he was such a storyteller, even just talking about his songs. And, you know, I thought that this would make you know, a great story in itself. So I looked into it and, you know, I didn't have the opportunity, unfortunately, to speak to either one of them. Robert passed away um, earlier in the 2000s and Richard, he, I had reached out to him and he gave me his blessing on the project, but he was doing too many projects uh, at the current time. So I kind of, you know, I, I talked to people who knew the Sherman Brothers personally and who had worked with them and, I went out to the Oscars archives in California and kind of dug around in there and put out articles and newspaper clippings from the 60s and just kind of pieced together their story. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was a two-year process to get the information that mm -hmm. put together to um, make the book. But it, the book spans from their childhood and how they kind of came from a musical background. And it goes through their time in the war and 
you know, how they met Walt and all throughout their career. So, you know, one of the things I think the Sherman Brothers, for me, you know, they do so well, is they create these songs that just stick in your head and don't leave. <laughs> you know, once you get, I'm not even going to say the title, <laughs> of that attraction <laughs> song in your head, it, you're literally humming it all day long. So is there something that they do, Katie, that you know puts these songs in our heads and we can't get them out? Well, they're definitely gifted songwriters for sure. And I know, you know, I, like I said, as a child, I sang all of these songs. And as an adult, they continued with me. And I still find myself singing them. And they had a motto. And any song that they wrote, they wanted it to be simple, sincere, and singable. So they called it the three S's. And, and they kind of learned that from their father, Al, who was also a songwriter. But they like to keep their songs simplistic and you know, have a, a message to them. But they definitely have, they like their songs to be bouncy. Mm. A lot of them, they're yeah. very, you know, upbeat, and they do stick in your head. And even the ones that aren't, I think more, some of their ballads even stick with me. And they like Feed the Birds, that song is always right. stuck in my head as well. That's not even one of the more upbeat ones. So they definitely have a gift with writing lyrics. But I think, I think although they're simple, even an adult can relate to them and I think that's why they kind of stick with us because we can kind of resonate with what we're hearing. I think another another aspect of how they write their songs is no matter what age the person listening to it, they can connect with it. Kids can connect with it because it's sing songy or bouncy or upbeat and simple. And then as we get older the, the thing that I've noticed about the Sherman Brothers writing, uh, especially my favorite song, which is Feed the Birds, is it taps into that nostalgia and that poignancy of getting older. And uh, just as an adult, it hits you on such a different level than than it would when you when you were a kid. Oh, definitely. I agree. And even uh, the song that's still not being <laughs> you're talking about it's a small world. You know, as a child, it was such an upbeat and fun song, but as an adult, you kind of appreciate the message behind it, that it's a prayer for peace, mm. that it's about, you know, in the eyes of a child, we're all the same, and I, I think that a lot of their songs have such deep meanings that maybe kids don't, you know, kind of go over their head, but that as adults, we can appreciate, and I think that's what makes their songs so timeless, that they, they can transition through generation to generation, and, you know, as you get older, you can appreciate different aspects of that song a little more. So what was the first project that they worked on for for Walt? Well, they had been working with Annette Funicello when they got a call from the Walt Disney Studios. And, you know, for them, that must have been just amazing, you know, just trying to make it in the, in the business there and having Walt Disney Studios call you up. I can't even imagine, you know, how amazing that must have been. But they had been called in to write songs for uh, the Horse Masters. And they had come in to the Disney Studios for an interview, and they had prepared a few songs, a song and a song, and a few other songs. And they didn't realize that they were actually going to be meeting Walt. So they thought, you know, they were just going to play it for some executives, and that would be it. So mm-hmm. when they were brought into Walt's office, you know, I think the panic kind of set in, like, oh, good Lord, you know, <laughs> we're going to be actually playing this for Walt. And they only got to play about 30 seconds of it. And Walt just said, that'll work. And originally, when they had first, before they even played the song, and they were doing the interview part, he thought they had come in to do songs for the parent trap, which would become the parent trap. And mm-hmm. they kind of looked at each other like, oh, no, we didn't write songs for that. And they started to panic. And, you know, they said, oh, Mr. Disney, we didn't you know, write songs for that. We came into the Horse Masters. So uh, the whole interview was kind of disastrous, but I, I think it was a beautiful disaster and came together perfectly. And they ended up doing music for both both uh project so it kind of worked out in their favor yeah i think so yeah. i would have to agree with that statement <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I th- yeah i think that story ends fine <laughs> yeah they're doing okay they did okay right uh so he started with uh the sherman started with that uh then they started doing stuff uh for disneyland because disneyland was being built what were some of the things they uh built uh songs for at, at disney world the attraction at disneyland yeah yeah the attractions um, Disneyland they did in the Tiki 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 Room, which is one of my favorite attractions. And one, that is definitely the song that's always stuck in my head. Yes, uh, it's now it's stuck in mine. Yeah, Thank you, a, I appreciate that. It's that one. <laughs> uh, so they did that one. And when Walt was doing the World's Fair in 1964, he had come up with 
it carries on progress and it's a small world, of course. And, you know, at that time, they were really, you know, his go-to boys, they were calling on for television films. And when he started doing attractions, he pulled them into that too. And so when he was doing the World Fair, he knew, okay, I got to get these boys on this. They got to, they got to come up with a theme for these. And he had these ideas for these attractions. And it's a small world. He kind of had the idea, you know, to have the children of the world singing a prayer for peace, but he didn't really know how to put it together. So he brought them in to create the theme. And, you know, he wanted it simple, but he wanted it something that could be sung in multiple languages. And of course, you know, if it was if it, anyone else but the Cameron Brothers, it probably wouldn't have been successful to come up with something, you know, that could transition in so many different languages. But right. they came up with it's a small world and I think everyone will agree it's probably one of the most well-known songs probably in the entire world. Probably, uh, you know, I think if you ask people in different countries, they've probably heard that song. But mm. uh, they also came up with There's a Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow, The Carousel of Progress. Yep. Um, and then they also came up with Time of Your Life mm. later on. And then it came back to There's a Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow. And then they've written several for Disney World as well. So when the, when the Shermans wrote... Did they write the lyrics together, or did somebody write the lyrics and somebody wrote the music, and then they then kind of collaborate? How did their process uh, go? Do we know? Um, they actually they both did lyrics and they both did music, so they just kind of they both would go at it and see you know what melody would stick, and if one came up with the melody, then they say okay, well that works. And then together, they would collaborate and come up with lyrics and kind of bounce lyrics off of each other. So they really had the perfect balance. You know, in team songwriting, and as brothers, I think that's amazing because I don't know that I could do that with my siblings, but yeah. they had like a perfect union for that. And you know, they balanced each other so well that they were able to bounce ideas off of each other, and they almost could finish each other's sentences. I would think, you know, when they were coming up with different lyrics and stuff, that one could come up with one part and the other one would be able to finish it. All the videos that I've seen, it's always Richard behind the piano and Bob sitting either near the piano or by the piano. Uh, I don't know. Did Bob even play any instruments? I'm not even sure that I know off the top of my head. I, their, their whole family it was musical. I know their yeah. mom played the piano and their dad did. I think Richard just kind of took more of the, he was more outgoing, and right. I think he kind of took the face of, of the group, of the duo. Um, Bob was more reserved, and I, I think he probably took more of the lyrical side. But I do know they did, both of them did do both. The legends of Walt Disney are vast. <laughs> and one of my favorite yet sad stories was the last time he spoke to the Sherman brothers. Could you uh, recant a little bit about that story and the last thing, specifically the last thing that he told uh, the Sherman brothers as he left the studios that night? You know, he, he had a big place in his heart for the Sherman brothers. And, um, you know, they were always his go-to boys. And I think that, I think that, you know, they shared a love of storytelling and they, they got him, I think, you know, they understood that he was this complex man, but deep down he was just a kid at heart and, you know, he could see even the simplest things and turn them into magic. And I think that's what they liked about him and what he liked about the Sherman Brothers also, if they could do the same thing in song. Right. Um, you know, they had working on a project and they were doing a screening of the project and they didn't realize that Walt was sick. You know, he had back injury from a old polo injury and, um, you know, he just had been going in and out of therapy and no one really thought anything of it. So they were watching a screening of one of their projects and Walt's go-to thing for them was battle work. You know, he never praised them. Oh, that's great. You know, the song is right. fantastic. It was just always the battle work. And that, you know, at first they thought, oh, you know, he hates their songs, he hates their stuff, but they grew to appreciate that meant, you know, he respected them. He liked what they had done. And this particular time, you know, as they were watching the screening of this film, he had come up to them and thanked them for their work and, you know, told them, keep up the good work, boys. And that right. was the last time that they had ever seen Walt. So I, I think for them it was, you know, it's definitely a sad story. It's definitely a sad moment. But I think it shows how much he did really appreciate their work mm -hmm. and respect them. And I think he wanted them to know that. And unfortunately, it was the last time that they saw him. But he did get it across how much he did appreciate everything that they had done for him. Yeah. I, I heard uh, Richard Sherman tell that story once. And uh, he was crying. And I think everybody in the audience was crying uh, at the same time. 
And, uh, you know, Richard said that, you know, him and Bob walked away and they had this you know, very weird feeling that that was the last time they were going to see him. And unfortunately it was. So uh, it's kind of weird. Kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it definitely, you know, I think it hit them very hard because they had always said that he was like a second father to them. Right. You know, he kind of took them under his thing. And he just really, I think he grew them, you know, under his his watch as songwriters to really develop them into what they are. And I, I think that he saw the potential that they had. And I think that he just really gave them the opportunity to score there at the Disney studio. Well, the Schumer Brothers had an epic career at Disney, but they also had had some interesting uh, projects. They worked outside of the umbrella of Walt Disney studios. Can you talk a little bit about the Sherman brothers projects outside of Walt Disney studios? Sure. Um, well, I think one of the most well-known things that they had done outside of Disney was City City Bang Bang. Uh, I, a lot of people I noticed, especially it's some Disney fans, they tend to think that is a Disney movie. I think because Dick Van Dyke is in it and it has the same kind of, you know, upbeat, happy plot to it, but it's not a Disney <laughs> Disney movie at all. Um, but their music is very similar to, I think, to something they would have done on a Disney project. So I think a lot of times people mistake that for a Disney project. But that was probably one of their more notable ones that is not you know, Disney related. They they did the Slipper in the Rose, which was um, you know, a take on Cinderella and they really they did Snoopy. Um, they did Snoopy Come Home and you know, I think a lot of the animations from the sixties and seventies, if you look into it somewhere there's a Sherman Brothers song in there. Um, you know, they just kinda of, they intertwined in and out of the entertainment business and definitely they're not just the most notable for Disney, but you know, things like Tootie Tootie Bang Bang and stuff. But that is a lot of childhood for a lot of people too. So I think that their work in there it may not be as well known, but I think you know, Snoopy. I grew up on Snoopy and the Penis sure. Gang as well. So a lot of my childhood that I didn't even know came from the Turbo Brothers still did come from them the more I looked into it. I hope that they had a great manager that is still there getting royalty checks for their body of work because that would be a shame if they did all this stuff and they don't get any money from it except the one-time payment. Right. I hope, uh, you know, somebody was working hard for the Shermans Mm -hmm. to make sure they got paid. So Walt Disney World uh, opened up here in Florida, and the Shermans had a little bit uh, to do with the uh, grand opening of the uh, Walt Disney World. What did the Shermans uh, do for that event, uh, Katie? Uh, well, they had the same you know attractions that they had done for you know, Disney World, the Tiki Room, and the Carousel of Progress, and it's a small world. They also did a lot for the Epcot. The Epcot theme park. Mm-hmm. They did Journey of the Imagination, Figment, and so let me ask you this. Uh, I think Roy Disney asked them uh, to write a song for the grand opening event. I think it was a, about the Orange Bird, if I, I was not mistaken. Yes, it was. Yeah. How did that whole process, I mean, how, did Roy just say, hey, guys, Walt's... You did it for Walt. Yeah. You got to do it for me, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm a Disney. Well, I think because, I, I think the Florida project was something that was near and dear to Walt's heart. You know, right. Disneyland was, you know, his, his baby, his first, you know, love. But I think the Florida project was definitely something that was where he was going to, you know, create his dream. That that was the one, the big one that, you know, he always wanted, he was always about progress and building tomorrow. And I think Epcot and everything he had planned out for that, that was the park that was really going to be Walt's vision, you know, encompass everything that he had been building. And I think Roy knew how important that was to Walt, you know, so he wanted to make sure that it was finished and that's why it was called Walt Disney World. Mm-hmm. So you kind of, you know, give him tribute to this dream that he had. And I think that Roy knew how important the Sherman brothers were to Walt at the same time and how important that Walt was to them. So I think he wanted to bring them in, you know, to help open this grand vision of Walt and kind of celebrate his his life and his being. So I think it was an honor for them, really, I, to be able to create a song for Walt like that for his, his grand opening of that park. And I think Roy knew it would be a special moment for all of them. Absolutely. That's why it was it was really great to see the Sherman Brothers get their window mm. at uh, Disneyland. 
uh, and I missed that ceremony by a month. And uh, so the first thing I did when I when we got to Disneyland, we didn't stop at our usual stop at the at the fire, fire station, you know, the firehouse to give our homage to Walt. We went directly to that window and snapped pictures of it. Did uh, did you find anything? Any comments that that um, that Richard had made about how that experience, uh, how that made him feel, even in, in spite of the loss of his brother? I did. You know, I think that was one of the pinnacle moments in his career that he really knew, you know, we meant something to this company. You know, it was an honor for him. Uh, but I think it was, I, I think it was more than that. I think it was a very, on a personal level, I think, you know, he knew with Walt, he had made it. But I think to be able to carry on even after Walt's death and for people today to still cherish your work, I, I think that speaks a lot. And for them to really realize, you know, they really are legendary and, they had um, a lyric in one of the Mary Poppins songs that he says is always his favorite, that, you know, he dreamed of walking with giants, and he said that at the Walt Disney Company, he had done that. But in my opinion, I think that they had become giants themselves. You know, they were they were legendary, and they still continue to be legendary to this day. As I said, they're, you know, their songs are they're timeless. They're right. things that my parents grew up on, I grew up on, and now my children are able to grow up on, and... I think being able to have that legend kind of immortalized in Walt's Park, I think, is the greatest honor anyone who works for the Disney company could have because you really know how much your work is appreciated. Hey, let me ask you a question. This is this is just a little bit off base, but it's a question I wanted to ask. Since you're as much of a fan of the Sherman Brothers as we are, did you see Iron Man 2? First question. It's crazy, I know. Did you see Iron Man 2? I did. So you know the question I'm going to ask. What was your thoughts when, like, I didn't know that the Sherman Brothers had a song in the in the movie, but when that music hit, Make Way for Tomorrow Today, I thought either somebody is is really stealing the Sherman Brothers or the Sherman Brothers have written a song for a Marvel movie. What, what's your opinion of that? Because I thought that was outstanding. Oh, I definitely agree. It was, it was definitely apparent when you heard it. For anyone who's a Sherman Brothers fan, that it was definitely written by them. Um, I kind of thought the same thing, and then I looked into it and I thought, wow, yeah, that, that doesn't seem like something they would write a song for. Right. I mean, I, I mean, personally, I, you know, <laughs> things with flying cars and stuff seems more like their, their bases. But um, I'm a big fan of the Marvel Universe, so to be able to see something like that, you know, it just, to me, it's just awesome <laughs> yeah. that they can even transition into something like that that their music is so versatile that they can go from you know animation to right. superheroes and yeah. attractions and I, I think it really brings in a new era of fans and people that will appreciate their music a lot of the younger generation I think can relate more to those movies than some sure. of the classics and so being able to you know transition that again is I think is just you know, phenomenal. They made that stuff, and I think it was definitely, I think it was a good step, in my opinion, to take that. I thought yeah. it was great that they tied it in, because the Stark Expo in the movie was a total ripoff of, you know, the the World's Fair. And mm-hmm. when that music kicked on, and it was it was playing, and I just, I, I really, my both my wife and I sat there, and we were like, that's a Sherman Brothers song. If it's not a Sherman Brothers song, they are literally trying to make it as close to a Sherman Brothers song as possible. And I just, I thought it was so great that not only did they tie in with the World's Fair, which is so much of a seminal event for, for Disney fans and, and anybody who's a fan of Walt Disney and the Sherman Brothers, that they would connect the dot to not only the event, but also to bring a song in. You know, it felt like a song that would be played 50 years ago but it was a brand new song and it was just it was perfect it's pitch perfect literally to use to use a, another franchise but i just i wanted to ask that question as as a fan and, and find out what you thought about it yeah i definitely i thought the same thing i thought it was amazing and like you said it, it sounded like something that kind of come from 50 years ago and i think because they did make the snark expo so similar to the world fair I don't know if that was their intention, you know, like I get the Sherman Brothers in here, you know, they were so involved with the World Fair, but whoever had that idea, it was definitely a brilliant one because, you know, my kids love the Marvel movies as well as I do, and 
for them to be able to go in, they probably, you know, they've heard probably far too many Sermon Brothers songs in the last two years, you know, since we started doing this because I love them, but they probably didn't pick up on it because they're too young, but for me to be able to, you know, see something nostalgic, and I know even in um, Tomorrowland, at the beginning of that movie when I heard the Carousel of Progress and things like that, just, just hearing their music in today's entertainment is just it's unbelievable to me because it's something like I said I grew up with and the Sherman Brothers were such a big part of my childhood so to see them today and being relevant to the generations of today I think is just tremendous so uh, as we wrap up what is you know something special you would tell somebody about the Sherman Brothers do they have a a special story special secret you know do they have a secret handshake you know <laughs> something special about them that m- maybe not everybody would know off the top of their their heads well i think the thing that people should know about the Sermon brothers is that they created so much more than the music you know when they worked on a project walt respected them so much that he didn't just have them come in and write a song for a film he asked their opinion and you know for Walt to ask their opinion on something really showed how much he truly did appreciate and respect their work and for things like Mary Poppins in the single book you know they did so much more than come in and create lyrics and tunes and themes for it they actually developed the entire story and plot line of the movies and the films around their music Mm -hmm. so Walt he knew them their music had to be in there and that their music could create the foundation for the story. So they would come up with the stories and, you know, after Walt approved them, he would bring in the story writers to work with the sermon. And the sermons actually worked, you know, hand in hand with the story writers and were part of the creative team creating the stories, you know, from start to finish. So I, I think that's I think that's something interesting that I personally had no idea that they did, that they were so involved with the story writing process that, you know, it went way beyond the music, that they kind of wrote the whole story and the film around their music. And I think that that says a lot because, yeah. you know, as songwriters, you would think they would just, you know, write the song and then be done, but they were so involved yeah. in the creative process that, right. you know, they helped develop all of the stories that we know and love. Yeah, it's probably because Walt always asked for their opinion and not just, hey, go write that song. And tell me when you're done with it. Right. You know. Mm-hmm. And it's fascinating that someone would have that much, you know, because Walt, you know, Walt didn't always have 100% fleshed out ideas, but there were times when he did. And so for him to be able to give up that much control and let somebody else have the say, especially on projects like Mary Poppins and projects like The Jungle Book, I mean, that's that just goes to show the level of confidence that Walt had in them and and the talent and that's that's why you're writing the book we're still appreciating the music we're buying CDs and and going and seeing movies that are made and it's just they're they're legends there's no other way to say it they're legends it's a lot. yeah I definitely you know they they really helped I think build the foundation of the Disney company that we know Walt was the dreamer the story maker and I, I think that they were definitely one of the most important cogs in that wheel in the golden era of Walt and you know he even appreciated them enough that he took their opinions on casting you know he would bounce ideas off for casting his films that I think is out of the realm of the songwriter but it just goes to show you how much he appreciated them as you know, people yeah. not just employees so uh, why don't you tell everybody where they can find more information about you, about your book, uh, anything on the social web that you would like to share with people? Why don't you tell people how to find your book? Sure. Well, my book is available on Amazon. It is available on Kindle and in print. So you can find it at the Walt Disney's Melody Maker, the biography of the Sherman Brothers by Catherine Price. It's available on Amazon. And you can find me on Instagram. I have an Instagram account, and it's Katie Fine Arts. It's K A T Y Fine Art, and it has some of my artwork up there as well as information about my book and a little bit about me as well. It's where you can find me online. Well, we can't thank you enough uh, for uh, giving us your time and telling us uh, all these great stories about you know Disney legends, the Sherman Brothers, uh, and we everybody should really go out there and uh, get the book because it is a lot of fun uh, to read through and, and and I found out some things I didn't know. Uh, reading the book too so go check it out uh it's walt disney melody makers uh and like katie said you can find that on amazon 
And that's it. As we'd like to say around here, we'll see you in the parks. Have you ever come to Orlando and you're the person that has to make all the dining plans, all the fast passes, get all the tickets? Well, we have a service that can help you do this. This is the best service. They are themeparkconcierge.com. You can call them up at 407-257-9973. Tell them your plans. They'll send you a little profile, get some information about you and your traveling party, what you want to do, what you don't want to do. And then they can set up a custom plan for you. And they'll take you around the parks. They'll make the dining plans. They'll get the fast passes. They'll take you to... Walt Disney World, they'll take you to Universal, they'll take you to Busch Gardens, to SeaWorld, to Legoland, to all of those places, and they will do all of the work for you. Contact them at themeparkconcierge.com, check them out on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Ramon VIP Concierge, or email them at Ramon at themeparkconcierge.com. I am telling you, you will not be disappointed. And if you tell them the Disney Parks podcast sent you, you'll get 10% off your order. The Disney Parks podcast is not affiliated with the Walt Disney Company. All Disney Parks, attractions, lands, shows, event names, etc. are registered trademarks of the Walt Disney Company. Like a boat out of the blue Fate steps in and sees you through.